So a real pleasure to have uh, Axel Klein here talking today. Uh, to give you a bit of a background of him, I, he did his PhD at the University of Hamburg in 1998, then went as a postdoc to Stanford to the Department of Biological Sciences, and then had an assistant professorship in the University of Maryland, Falls Park. And then uh, from 2006, he is in the Max Planck Research. A Max Planck Research Group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biology, Biology Chemistry in Vienna and Germany. He has uh, worked a very long time uh, on this topic already on thermodynamic foundations. Actually, uh, he probably doesn't remember, but we met at one point in Singapore at the first AOGS meeting in 2004. <laughs> I don't know whether you remember, but could be. And uh, a long really time, yeah. I'm really looking forward to uh, you know to your talk. So Axel, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And um, yes, and I mean the title says it. It's about thermodynamics. And uh, I think over all these years, what um, I I've learned is that actually one doesn't need much thermodynamics, but that little bit that is left is really really important. And it deals with how Earth system processes can actually perform work. And when you think about it, like physical work, you know, how do you accelerate things? How do you lift things? How do you create chemical disequilibrium so that you can run metabolisms associated with life? And that involves thermodynamics. And that also relates to certain forms of optimality that I will get to at the end. Um, yeah. And so I will actually want to start with um, sort of the common view of Earth system science. And this is sort of, you know, so sort of the, this Bretherton diagram, I think, captures it really well. It has it's quite a complex system. It has lots of dynamics, lots of boxes, and they interact, and there are arrows in both directions. And now, why I'm mentioning these arrows in both directions is that when you think about thermodynamics, there's something called the second law, and that gives you one direction. It doesn't give you two directions. And so what I want, this is sort of the direction I want to go in this talk. Um, so we want to look at the Earth system and we can ask, you know, why do things happen quite general in the Earth system? And um, the longer you talk about it, you know, preferably probably with a glass of beer or wine or something, you know, then sooner or later you say, well, it must have something to do with the second law and entropy, right? I mean, this is sort of because it gives you a direction. And um, well, I mean, yes, sure, a direction is good, but actually what is more relevant, I think, or equally as relevant, is that it actually gives limits to um, Earth system processes. Um, and one particular limit I will be showing in a minute is actually the uh, well-established Carnot limit um, of a heat engine, or when you think about it in more practical terms, of a power plant and how much energy a power plant can generate. And I'll show you that this is actually setting a very relevant limit um, or relevant constraint to the dynamics of um, Earth systems. Um, and I want to show you some examples of how we can actually use that approach and estimate climate really from first principles and also a few examples of climate change. And uh, we can also look at how actually life comes into play. And so I hope I can show you that um, it's really a really good basis to do Earth system science and um, to understand optimality. And actually, um, I, I, I'm afraid I, I probably have too many slides, but I will try to get to get to the end because I think I have one slide on sustainability as well, which sort of fits to your um, overarching theme, which I think also has quite an important implication. Okay, so. Um, entropy, direction. When we want to look at the Earth system, actually the most basic direction there is, is that when you think about the Earth being heated by solar radiation and cooled by terrestrial radiation, there's actually entropy associated with it. It's something that I would say is not very commonly described. When you look into standard textbooks, they're usually not talking about radiation entropy, but it's something that is really well established in physics. Um, this is, after all, what Max Planck won a Nobel Prize for and derived radiation laws more than 100 years ago. And um, 
So you can think about solar radiation. I mean, solar radiation, when you think about it in terms of quantum um, physics, it's, it's a flux of photons. And solar radiation has a low radiative entropy. It was a radiation or energy, electromagnetic waves emitted at a very high temperature. And so it has comparatively few highly energetic photons. And then, you know, radiation is absorbed, you know, it's digested and converted in the Earth system. And eventually it is emitted to space, but at a much colder temperature in the infrared range. And that, con that basically is represented by a flux of many more photons that are much less energetic. And so we have high entropy output in form of radiation. It's not heat, it's radiation. Yeah, so it's radiation entropy. But in between, we have that solar radiation gets absorbed at the surface, and then you, we get heat, um, heat with a somewhat higher um, uh, thermal entropy, so the normal physical classical thermodynamics entropy, and then the atmosphere is colder, and so it has an even higher entropy. Okay, so Earth system processes produce entropy um, because we have a forcing of um, low entropy radiative input and high um, uh, radiative um, loss on export of high entropy. But then, as I was saying, there's actually really quite important, there is actually also associated with the thermodynamics, there are limits. And I want to illustrate this with this example of a power plant. Now, I think it's quite a nice example, although the power plant is not so nice. It's a coal-firing power plant that I show here from, um, this is, this is um, south of um, Leipzig. So what happens in this power plant is it takes chemical energy in form of brown coal, um, it combusts it, it creates heat at a high temperature, and that heat at high temperature corresponds to a low thermal entropy. And um, so you add energy with low entropy to that power plant to the conversion process. Some of it ends up in, the, in electricity or energy that is useful that you can use to perform work or I would actually want to call it here free energy because essentially one can describe it as energy without entropy. Um, and you may also have entropy export that's actually really important um, and you can see this in form of the cooling tower you have a flux of here of water vapor. So you have um, a cooling tower where a lot of heat actually leaves the power plant at a comparatively low temperature. And because heat at a low temperature, when you take heat amount divided by temperature and the temperature is low, then you have a high entropy flux. Okay, so how do we get a limit from this? And um, I want to just quickly sketch out how you get this from the first and second law. So the first law is actually quite simple. It means that the heat that comes into the power plant is balanced by the heat that leaves the system uh, through the, uh, it's called the waste heat flux through the chimneys and the power that is generated in form of electricity. And that goes into the electric grid. And that then uh, like I, we consume in households and dissipate it back into heat. Um, so this is um, the G here. And so the first law just says it's basically conserved. The energy is being conserved. Now the other constraint comes from the second law and the second law we write here in form of an, what's called an entropy budget. So what we have is that we have heat entering the system, but at a low temperature, heat exiting the system at a um, low temperature, you know, this is a high temperature, low temperature. And then we may have some irreversible processes inside the system. So they're, you know, that's called entropy production. And um, so we basically balance the entropy exchange of the system. This is the two fluxes here with the entropy production within the system. And the, the second law tells us that this entropy production can only be um, greater or equal to zero. So it can't be negative. So that's the, there's like a constraint there. Now we can take the best case and the best case is we don't have entropy production. And so then we have a system where the entropy output here through the chimney is just as large as the entropy input into the system. Um, and then we can use this equation and substitute here the J out in here. And then we solve it for the G and we get um, a limit to how much um, free energy or how much electricity we can at best generate. 
and this yields the what is called um, the Carnot limit. So the limit to power generation is equal or less or equal to the um, heat flux that goes into the power plant times this ratio of temperatures, which is known as the Carnot efficiency. So it depends on the temperature difference. Okay, um, so that is um, what I want to illustrate here is also that this is actually quite a general limit. So um, we, doesn't, we don't actually need to think about the specific thermodynamic cycle of how this work is being performed. It is just derived from the first and second law. And one can actually also generalize this kind of um, derivation to not just to take heat, but also to radiation. And this is done, for example, for solar panels to um, evaluate their maximum power that they can get. But that's not what I want to go into. OK, so we have a limit. And now we can um, think about it. When we think about it back to the Earth, um, we get solar radiation and thermal radiation goes to space. And now we have basically two choices. And the choices are to work or not to work. Um, on the one hand side, we can have dissipative processes that just produce entropy. And um, examples here are radiative transfer or diffusion. These are processes that don't involve work. They just um, dissipate and, uh, or they just produce entropy. Or we can actually generate um, free energy or we can have power. And this free energy drives dynamics or dissipative dynamics, for example, atmospheric motion or hydrologic cycling or carbon cycling. And this energy is then dissipated back to heat, produces entropy, and then eventually exported. And so I want to focus on this one here, on this, and, and give you also in a few slides the examples of, um, of atmospheric motion. And um, actually, I, we will get to these examples. And um, we can also think about that some of this energy may could get converted further into other forms. Um, okay. So when we think again about the planetary perspective, so we have here the entropy forcing. So we have um, radiative input, radiative output, and there are different ways we can um, generate this useful energy. Um, the first example are just power plants, like what we just have seen, and that use a difference in heat. And um, this is actually what the atmosphere uses. And this is how sort of the atmosphere generates its motion. Um, and it uses temperature differences. So it uses thermal entropy differences, um, like um, the main one between the surface and, um, and the radiative temperature of the atmosphere. But then there are two other ways that um, free energy can be generated. One is photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is quite different because it's not a heat engine. It uses radiation directly. It does photochemistry. And the other option is actually photovoltaics, which is also different um, because, again, it does, it's not a heat engine, but it uses radiation directly. And I want to sort of show you this distinction between heat versus not heat, uh, because actually that goes into a little bit of physics. Um, so. Um, I want to sort of illustrate this in this diagram here. So when we have solar radiation, that's electromagnetic waves. And um, these electromagnetic waves can interact with something that is electromagnetic, so something charged. And so it interacts with electrons. Um, and so a photon of solar radiation can be absorbed. It can be raised into some, something called an excited state. It goes sort of to increase in the shell. So it absorbs this photon and increases its energy. And um, then if nothing else happens, then what happens is that it's called, uh, it, it thermalizes. So it means it falls back slowly or over different steps into the ground state. And eventually it re results in this random motion of molecules that we describe as temperature. And that thermalization actually produces a lot of entropy because the Earth's surface is much colder than the emission temperature of the sun. And then, you know, the atmosphere is even colder and then this differential heating can be used to run power plants like in the atmosphere or heat engines in the atmosphere. Now, photosynthesis and solar panels are different because they capture these electrons and use that energy before it gets thermalized. And so these processes can actually, in principle, 
be much more efficient in deriving work from sunlight. And um, I will get to that somewhat more at the end of the talk. Okay, so now we need to sort of place it back into the Earth system context. So it's not just about performing work, but it's also about interactions. And so this is a um, picture here that I was, would like to call, or we, we call it sort of the onion. It's like different shells, different shells of different forms of energy. And so we have solar radiation or low entropy radiation and can uh, get absorbed, um, result in heat. And then we have heat engines performing work into generating motion. And from motion, one can drive cycling with it, like hydrologic cycling. Or we have photosynthesis driving life or photovoltaics hopefully um, is, uh, powering future human civilizations. And then we have interactions. So as soon as you have motion, you also transport heat. And so you actually compensate or deplete heating differences. And we need to take these into account. And we'll see that in a minute of how this actually plays together with um, thermodynamic limits. Because in the end, what I want to show you is that these systems or these, these processes that perform work appear to work at their limit, so they work as hard as they can. And because they work as hard as they can, they can be predicted in a relatively simple way, um, which seems to ignore the complexity of the system. Um, and um, this is sort of what I want to give you examples for. So specifically, um, I have um, sort of this list here of examples. I want to give you an example of powering climate, how thermodynamics constraints motion and determines temperature, um, powering cycling, hydrologic cycling, how thermodynamics shapes evaporation and in steady state evaporation balances precipitation. So we have a description of the hydrologic cycle. We have um, powering life, so to do with photosynthesis. And then I want to get a little bit into optimality and um, close with a brief summary. Okay, climate. So, um, I'm getting back to this picture from the very beginning. Um, it's actually, I think it's a really pretty landscape in, in, uh, in uh, Italy. It's in Umbria, you know, a sunny day in spring, you know, the surface is heated. What happens? So sunlight heats the surface by absorption. The atmosphere cools by emission of radiation. And in between, we can basically run a power plant or um, um, heat engine to generate power. This power generates motion. And this motion maintains turbulent heat fluxes that fuel this power plant. Okay, so this is the picture. We can actually make this more quantitative. So we take the Carnot limit that we had a moment ago um, and say, okay, so we have a heat flux. These are the turbulent heat fluxes. Um, then we have this temperature difference between the surface and the radiative temperature of the atmosphere. Those, this one we can describe by what's called the top of atmosphere energy budget. So the long wave emission to space, we can write this as sigma times the radiative temperature to the four. And in a climatological mean state, what goes in goes out. And so the abs total absorbed solar radiation should balance the emission to space. So the radiative temperature is pretty much a fixed thing in the system. Um, then um, we need to have a formulation for the surface temperature. The surface temperature, well, we, you know, we use the surface energy budget. So we have the surface being heated by absorption of solar radiation. This is the RS. It's heated by the greenhouse effect. It's this long wave, um, the downwelling flux of long wave radiation here, RLD. And it is cooled by emission, thermal emission of um, um, the sigma TS to the four. And it is cooled by turbulent fluxes. And here now, I, for simplicity, I add the sensible and latent heat flux together. Now we can use this, linearize it a bit to make it simpler. And then we get an expression for this temperature difference, um, which has sort of two radiation things in here and it has the turbulent heat fluxes in here. So we can see that as we increase the turbulent heat fluxes, this efficiency term actually decreases. And so this yields you a maximum in power with an optimized, if you want, an optimum heat flux that are somewhere in between. And we also can infer temperatures from that. Now, this is something that we can test. And what I'm showing here is some, um, actually some current results from Sairosh, um, who is a PhD student in my group. Um, so we can use radiation data sets from NASA, solar radiation, terrestrial radiation, 
apply this maximum power approach and estimate heat fluxes and temperatures. Um, actually, it works remarkably well. So here is the surface temperature um, estimated or the um, observed by, by Ceres. And this is the temperature um, predicted by maximum power. Here, the same for the turbulent heat fluxes. So um, very high correlation coefficient and it um, appears to work really well. Um, we can also do this on the seasonal scale. Um, so we do this um, on the monthly scale. And um, so the seasonal temperature variation on land, we can also predict really well. You can see it's a little bit um, overestimated compared to the one-to-one -one line. And there's some kind of root mean square error here. So it's not perfect. I mean, of course, it's not perfect. It's a really simple approach, but it can capture the patterns really quite well. Okay, so um, bringing it back, sort of uh, doing a quick summary here. So when we think about thermodynamics, it's actually um, climate is a um, system in disequilibrium because heating and cooling takes place at different spaces. Uh, uh, places. So we have um, the absorption of solar radiation at the surface and the emission from space, and that generates a vertical disequilibrium and a temperature difference. And um, then we can use that temperature difference with a heat engine to um, actually generate power to maintain turbulent heat fluxes. And these heat fluxes, they deplete this disequilibrium. Then I showed you that you know, we can actually have a maximum power limit. So it's working at the limit. So these turbulent heat fluxes, um, because they deplete this temperature difference, um, there is a, power, uh, a maximum in power. Um, and um, for those of you, if you have a little bit of background in um, Boundary layer meteorology, it's basically similar to saying that this maximum power is a maximum buoyancy production in the turbulent kinetic energy budget. Um, then I showed you an application of it, that it can actually capture the seasonal and geographic temperature variations on land really well. And what it actually means in the end is that surface temperatures are predominantly um, determined by radiation, either directly because of the radiative input or indirectly because this maximum power limit um, is actually also reflected, uh, um, reflecting the radiative forcing. Okay, so that's the part on powering climate. The next example I want to use is hydrologic cycling. So here we have a disequilibrium because what we actually have is that at the surface, um, evaporation takes place. So it's the phase transition from liquid to vapor, while the reverse phase transition from vapor to liquid takes place in the atmosphere. Now, this takes place at different temperatures. So the, the evaporation takes place at warmer temperatures um, where the saturation vapor pressure is higher. And um, the condensation, the opposite um, phase transition, takes place at colder um, temperatures. And so um, it is further down here on the vapor saturation, um, vapor, uh, uh, saturation vapor pressure curve. And, um, and both of these processes actually try to reestablish thermodynamic equilibrium, which is described by saturation. Now, um, what we actually need to maintain this, um, these um, phase transitions is that we actually have motion. We need to have buoyant transport that brings the moisture up into the atmosphere. And on the other hand, we have precipitation, so the removal of liquid water from the atmosphere, which acts to dehumidify um, the air. Um, and in this whole process, what actually happens that um, results in hydrologic cycling is that evaporation takes up a lot of heat at the surface. Um, so it is, if you want, an um, energy input of low entropy, while the condensation releases that heat at a colder temperature, so it has a higher entropy. And so the whole hydrologic cycle is actually associated with entropy production. Now, if we want to focus on where actually, or what's setting the constraints on the intensity of hydrologic cycling, I want to now look at actually down here at the surface at the evaporation rate and link it to a concept that's actually quite well established that's called equilibrium evaporation. Um, and that's a concept that's known in um, hydrology and um, say um, boundary layer meteorology to some extent, I think. Um, 
So let's look at evaporation, because if we know the constraint on evaporation, then we also know that this constrains precipitation. OK, um, so when solar radiation heats the surface and the surface puts heat or energy into the atmosphere, then this what it does is on the one hand side, it heats the air, so it increases the thermal energy. But if it is kept at saturation, then it also actually acts to moisten the air. So um, the temperature increases and the saturation increases as heat is added to the surface. Now, I give you here ex um, equations. Um, I just want to show that one can get some pretty simple ratios um, out of this. Um, this is what's described by this equilibrium partitioning that um, goes back to um, sort of Austrian meteorologist called, hang on, I have that on this down here, Schmidt, an Austrian uh, meteorologist, Wilhelm Schmidt, I think in 1915. Um, so we have this two simple ratios. S is the um, slope of the saturation vapor pressure curve and the gamma is what's called the psychometric constant. So we have two ratios and um, they are nicely constrained between zero and one. And as we go to warmer temperatures, then we can see that more of the heating goes into moistening the air, while when we go to colder temperatures, actually more of the added heat go, uh, added energy goes into heating the air. And then we can use this partitioning to infer the sensible and latent heat flux. And we can um, link this directly then to um, called either the equilibrium evaporation rate, or you can also call it the potential evaporation rate. Now we can use um, the estimate of the turbulent fluxes from the previous part and apply this partitioning. So we can derive a map of potential evaporation from this radiative forcing, uh, combine it with the precipitation um, data set. This is here. Um, GC, oh, I didn't put the source here. That's um, bad. I mean, this is the uh, GPCP um, precipitation data set. And then take the minimum, either you know, either the potential evaporation limits actual evaporation, or the precipitation limits actual evaporation, and infer evaporation from it. And then, then we see that in the actually in the humid areas, we have that potential evaporation limits evaporation. And in the desert areas where there is a lack of water, we actually have, oops, that, um, uh, that is actually the water um, limited, um, that the actual evaporation is limited by water. And then, and this is um, the work again by, by Sarosh, um, my PhD, uh, PhD student, actually there's um, the latent heat flux inferred from this um, maximization again, uh, actually compares quite well two observations here taken from this um, FluxCom data set um, of eddy covariance measurements. And to show you one uh, application to climate change, actually this kind of uh, partitioning actually works really well in explaining the magnitude of the intensification of the hydrologic cycling that you get with uh, um, warming. So when you take um, um, climate model simulations of a five degree um, warming, you find an increase of the hydrologic cycling by about 10 or 11 percent. And this is exactly what you would get from this shift in this equilibrium partitioning at the surface. OK, so I want to also summarize this part. So about powering um, cycling, in this case, hydrologic cycling. So. The starting point is equilibrium, which is um, saturated air, um, reflecting the thermodynamic equilibrium of um, the water-air system. And then when we think about disequilibrium, it's basically the separation, or oh, perhaps just one step back, when you think about equilibrium, I don't know how much you um, are familiar with this, but I mean, basically you can think about saturation as that the evaporation rate and the condensation rate actually are locally the same and so that you don't have a change in, in moisture. And so what happens with disequilibrium is that you have a spatial temporal separation of evaporation where evaporation takes place and where condensation and precipitation takes place. Um, then we have the dehumidification of the air by precipitation at cold temperatures in the atmosphere that dehumidifies the air and creates this disequilibrium when this dried air comes back to the surface. Um, evaporation depletes that 
um, this equilibrium, and but it requires really the motion to operate. Then we talked about this equilibrium partitioning so that heat and moisture is added at the surface at saturation, or in, you can also call it in thermodynamic equilibrium. So that's uh, hopefully where this equilibrium partitioning comes from, this term. Um, and I showed you the application that actually one can get evaporation estimates that compare very well with um, observations. And one can also infer the sensitivity of hydrologic cycling to global warming that fits very well with um, climate model simulations. Um, OK, so the next part I want to talk about is um, um, the application to life of photosynthesis. Um, OK, photosynthesis, now we are leaving the physical realm and go into chemistry. And what photosynthesis does, you know, the sort of um, when you go back to sort of high school physics, uh, biology, perhaps, or chemistry, um, what photosynthesis does is uh, basically is a you can describe it like a reaction of water and carbon dioxide. And it takes energy and makes um, organic carbon or sugars out of it. And I just use here this sort of um, abbreviated form CH2O to express this organic carbon. So it is um, so organic carbon and it produces oxygen. And so, um, yeah, now it uses energy and it, well, it's not just using energy and it doesn't use heat. It actually uses solar radiation because when you actually look at the details of photosynthesis, it's actually a photochemical process. So it uses solar radiation, it um, uses solar radiation to split water and to do charge separation in the photosystems. Um, this is sort of part, called the light uh, reactions of the um, chlorophyll. Um, so it splits water into proton and electron, and then this, uh, these separated charges are used by what's called the dark reactions in the Calvin cycle to fix CO2. So it takes up CO2 from the atmosphere, and then the CO2 is being um, converted into the organic carbon. Now, thermodynamically, what we have is that we have chemical disequilibrium on the right-hand side or chemical free energy, while we have chemical equilibrium on the left-hand side. And that we have chemical disequilibrium and free energy, um, this is something that one can really easily see. I mean, if you think about organic carbon, for instance, in terms of firewood, you can burn it using oxygen and release the, heat, uh, release the energy as heat. Um, so you can um, convert it into thermal energy and produce entropy with it. Now, this free energy uh, is uh, naturally being used by the biosphere to drive the metabolisms of the living organisms. So about half of the um, energy, the free energy that photosynthesis produces is produced by the, uh, is being consumed by the metabolisms of the plants themselves. And the other half roughly is consumed by heterotrophs. So these are animals but also we humans consume it in terms of food and probably what you're eating at the moment in terms of carbohydrates. This is also um, to, to um, um, maintain your own uh, metabolism. So now we want to, again, think about, you know, where are the limits to this um, process? Um, and I'm focusing on, on land. Um, so let's first look at what happens thermodynamically. So we can look at... Um, what photosynthesis does, it um, uses um, eight to 10 photons of a certain wavelength in the near infrared. They correspond to an energy amount of um, 1.8 electron volt. That is an energy unit in, um, when you deal with quantum, um, at the quantum scale. And um, that yields about 14 to 18 electron volts of energy. And this is actually pretty good because when you look at um, the energy that you need to split water, uh, split, I'm um, sorry, to do the charge separation of the hydrogen atom, you actually need about this much energy. So that's actually, um, photosystems are actually doing a pretty good job there. And um, then you can convert it to a mole basis and you get about 1.4 megajoules of energy for each mole of carbon that you want to fix. Then photosynthesis produces organic carbon 
And the result is then sugar, and sugar has an energy content about, of about 0.48 megajoules. And so you can calculate an efficiency, divide this, the output by the input, and you get an efficiency. Ah, hang on. And then you need to also consider that um, photosynthesis only uses about half of the spectrum of solar radiation, what's called the photosynthetically active radiation. And then you get an efficiency of 17%. And that's an efficiency that is well known and documented. I mean, I put a few references down here. I think the earliest was actually done by a Dutch guy, uh, Duisens, in 1962. And then over the years, you can see that um, that has actually um, been evaluated, um, these limits, uh, or this 17% for quite some time. Now, when you look at natural ecosystems, and you can do this by um, using data sets of um, carbon fixation. This is here a data set um, from the CASA biosphere model um, that uh, uses um, satellite data to estimate carbon uptake. And you divide it, you convert it into the energy equivalent um, of how much sugar is being fixed, and you divide it by this absorbed solar radiation, then you get that the efficiency is only one to 2%. Um, of the carbon uptake. So it's much, much lower than this simple evaluation that I showed you before. And um, this also has been long known. Actually, um, John Monteith um, in the 70s uh, has already inferred that from um, evaluations in, um, in, in Britain and also in the tropical rainforest, so that the efficiency, the natural ecosystems are um, always below 3% efficiency. And so one can say, well, so it's probably not working at the thermodynamic limit, but actually what I want to show you here is that there is an interpretation that would allow for um, the claim that actually is also, that the um, terrestrial ecosystems also actually work at their limit. And for that, we need to recognize that actually um, plants need the CO2 from the air. And as they want to absorb the CO2 from the air, they, they do this by having little openings called stomates. And as they take up the CO2 through these stomates, they can't avoid losing water. And so this is a process called gas exchange. So they basically trade carbon for water. So they evaporate water and get CO2 for it. And the water that they lose by evaporation is actually much, much more than what they use uh, in photosynthesis. And this ratio or between CO2 uptake versus water loss is a well-known um, ecophysiological concept called water use efficiency. And when one uses this um, data set I just showed you um, in the previous slide of um, CO2 uptake from this biosphere model, one finds that the efficiency is actually quite constrained uh, about, and, and the number here is that it's about two grams of carbon um, that the plants get and fix for each kilogram of water that they lose. And you can see there is some spread, but the two is a pretty good number for that. Now, if that is the so if that's a requirement, so the plants need the CO2, then one can actually infer um, another indirect thermodynamic limitation. And this is going like this. So what we have is that solar radiation also heats the surface. The heating of the surface results in turbulent fluxes, and about half of this goes into turbulent fluxes. Turbulent fluxes, part of this is actually evaporation. So this equilibrium partitioning, if you use global mean conditions, it's about 70%. And then the equilibrium evaporation rate sets actually a limit to this gas exchange. And then we can use this water use efficiency and multiply these efficiencies. And when we do this, then we actually get, and I mean, this is here, the water use efficiency converted in, into energetic units. We actually recover this 1% uh, efficiency of photosynth photosynthesis. And so it seems like that this is actually the bottleneck, this, um, and that the gas exchange is actually what's limiting photosynthesis and that one would actually get, so when one applies this line of reasoning, when, so one takes the evaporation estimate, um, the limiting, um, what I showed you uh, a few slides before, this limit of evaporation, 
converts this with a water use efficiency, one can actually recover this low efficiency that was um, calculated in this CASA model um, with an interpretation that actually um, the terrestrial ecosystems couldn't do any better because they um, need to get at the CO2 and by doing so they lose the water and the water loss is being constrained. Um, now there are a few tricks to push these limits and I want to show you one, one um, example of um, pushing, ah, no, hang on, I have one more slide to just show you that um, this is, perhaps I just do quickly, I notice the time is uh, sort of also coming to an end. And um, I just want to show you quickly, this is um, observations from a rainforest in the Amazonia where our institute is involved with, and um, the lines are what's predicted by this maximum power limit. And you can see that it looks like as if the rainforest operates at this physical limit um, of equilibrium partitioning that reproduces the observations really well. Now, but there is a way to pushing the limit. And that is our, the example I want to give here is that uh, there are many regions in the world where climate is seasonal. So you have regions or time periods where there is a water surplus because you have a wet season, you have a surplus of water, and then you have a dry season and you have a water deficit. And um, in principle, if you would be able to store water from the wet season and transfer it to the dry season, you could evaporate more and maintain gas exchange for a longer period. And this is what actually plants do. They have root systems. And by root systems, they can use the soil to store water for the dry season and um, extend the period of where they can evaporate. One can use, um, again, these data sets to do an estimate and one gets that um, especially in these uh, seasonal tropics, one gets a, a substantial enhancement um, of evaporation due soil water storage and um, overall evaporation as well as productivity would actually increase by 12%. Okay, so quick summary. So with life, what we have is a disequilibrium between uh, in the form of carbohydrates and oxygen. They want to react, they want to, uh, or they can react and uh, produce heat. Um, resulting in water and CO2. And this disequilibrium is generated by photosynthesis, first by, um, by the work of splitting water and separating charges. Um, the efficiency is much lower than expected uh, from the thermodynamics when converting sunlight. But one can explain the low efficiency by the limit of gas exchange. Um, and the gas exchange, again, is indirectly limited by thermodynamics via how much can evaporate. And then I showed you this one example of working at the limit by these root systems maximizing the ability to maintain gas exchange um, during dry episodes. Okay, so I noticed that the 45 minutes are almost up. So I want to now just have a moment to actually talk more about optimality and implications of this. And um, so I think, our, uh, so I, I, I title this as follow the energy. So um, now what we talked about is this generation of free energy, but in principle, one can convert this further. So we have solar radiation, then we need a process to generate some free energy to drive dynamics. And then eventually it's dissipated and then disappears from the system by, by terrestrial radiation. But we can convert it further into some other form and even perhaps some other form. Now that sounds pretty abstract. So I want to give you an example, sort of a physical example. Oh yeah, and then you can have feedbacks in all directions or something, you know. Um, so one example is um, atmospheric dynamics where you have this heat engine generating atmospheric motion then atmospheric motion can, some of that energy is converted at the surface because it forces ocean waves, for instance, and then you have energy in form of waves. And these ocean waves, they transfer some of their energy further to the wind-driven circulation in the, in the mixed layer of the oceans. So you have like a cascade of energy conversions. And then always you have some frictional losses here that are indicated by the blue arrows. You also have that for the biosphere. Um, so we saw photosynthesis generates chemical free energy and it results in biomass of producers. And then this energy can be converted, for instance, by, by the consumers or herbivores or by detrivores um, can be converted 
and then it can be converted further by um, carnivores and um, overall it's being dissipated by metabolic activities of these parts of the um, of the biosphere. So when we want to extend the idea of optimality and thermodynamics to this, then um, the only thing I've basically talked about here is sort of the maximum power limit here and how it is indirectly or directly or indirectly shaping different processes that generate this free energy. When you look into the literature, you can see a lot of other forms of thermodynamic optimality. You see minimum dissipation, maximum dissipation, or minimum entropy production or maximum entropy production. So I want to take a moment to sort of sort this a little bit out. So what we have here is so we generate power and then we can convert it further. And here we can say, okay, well, perhaps we, perhaps systems aim to maximize this power transfer from one um, from one level to the next. It's actually something that um, Alfred Lotka um, talked about already over 100 years ago, and also um, the Odom brothers um, in ecology talked about maximum power transfer in ecosystems and food, food webs and trophic um, um, levels. When you have maximum power transfer here, then these dissipative parts here are probably minimized. So you can have a minimum dissipation and it is actually no contradiction to having maximum power transfer. It's just a way of how you look at the system. But in the end, when you look at this whole system, then this maximization of power in the first place actually balances in steady state all the dissipative terms. So in steady state, you have power equals the sum of all dissipative terms. And if you maximize power, then you also maximize the sum of all these dissipative terms. Now, as dissipation is the conversion of this free energy into heat, and heat at a, released at a certain temperature produces entropy, it is actually also related to entropy production. But it makes a difference because it is not just entropy production, because also like what we talked about in the beginning about work or not work. Yeah, so I mean, some processes produce entropy without performing work. Um, so it makes actually a big difference whether they perform work and so the dissipation results from free energy or not. And the last slide I have before the summary, so I'm almost at the end, is um, um, I think this is actually quite relevant for sustainability. So when we think about human activity at the moment, then humans are actually also the dissipative system. What we do is we take free energy away from the earth system in terms of the food we appropriate. It's a concept called human appropriation of net primary productivity. Our agricultural systems take um, chemical energy away from the natural biospheres to feed us. And actually also in the future, we can think about renewable, certain renewable forms of energy taking energy out of um, the natural earth system to convert it into primary energy that humans can use. So as humans appropriate free energy from the Earth system, there is um, obviously less being left around for natural processes to dissipate. There is a way out, and that is um, by using actually photovoltaics, because photovoltaics is a lot more efficient than photosynthesis in generating free energy. Um, the way you can think about it, I mean, photovoltaics nowadays has an efficiency of 20%. Photosynthesis, we saw, has a 1% or 2%. Now, why is that? Well, uh, photovoltaics doesn't need to transport mass. It doesn't need to take up CO2 because it just exports electrons along um, through a wire. So it's much simpler um, form of free energy, and, uh, uh, and it can be a lot more efficient. And so if we take this energy directly from photosynthesis, uh, for photovoltaics, we can actually reduce um, the appropriation here. I sh show this here by reducing that little arrow there. Okay, but that's just sort of on the side. And so I want to just quickly give a summary here. So what I'm talking, uh, what I've been talking about is thermodynamics and the role in the Earth system in terms of setting a direction and also in terms of limiting how much work can be derived from sunlight to drive dissipative dynamics. Um, 
I talked about the concept of free energy, that is um, energy without entropy, that is able to perform work and which can sustain further conversions and dissipative dynamics. Um, I talked about the limits and gave examples from climate, hydrologic cycling and um, biotic productivity, and they seem to operate at their limit. Although climate, there is a real maximum power limit that I showed you in terms of um, you know, heat flux and temperature difference. Um, and then with hydrologic cycling and biotic productivity, I showed you that these are actually more indirect limits that are due to the ability of the atmosphere to transport mass. Um, then one can link this to optimality. And we talked, so this maximum power can be associated with optimal fluxes. And we can also take this further in terms of this maximum power transfer, perhaps. But this is, I would say, open research still to think about how much it can apply. And then in terms of the, the relevance, I think there are actually two quite different ones. Now, on the one hand side, on the more theoretical side, it leads some, I think these limits actually result in this simplicity of vastly complex Earth system processes. When you think about it, Turbulence is a vastly complex process, but these estimates from maximum power, they actually work really well. And why is that? And, and I, I think the explanation for that is that turbulence is so complex that what's actually constraining is it in the end is only the thermodynamics of it. And those can be formulated in a relatively simple way, including the interactions with the energy balances. And then there is a much more practical side to things because with this thermodynamic view and um, this um, powering processes of the planetary system, actually one has also an access to the limits to renewable energy. And actually I've also done quite a bit of work on limits to wind energy, and they actually have really important, um, um, relevant or really high relevance to, to energy transition scenarios. So we already had some work with, um, you know, like um, a think tank in Germany on, energy scenarios in um, Germany to account for that, that and that regards particularly wind energy as one form of renewable energy. And um, yeah, and at the end, I also gave you a sort of a quick insight or, or a quick slide on that. I think actually it's also quite important for sustainability. And with this, I thank you for um, attention. I think you're not all asleep. So I think <laughs> at least some of you, I think are still moving and um, yeah. So I think I stopped you. Oh. Thank you very yeah. much. That was really a nice overview and a very, very nicely presented. So thank you very much. So uh, yeah, we have quite a number of people online, quite a number of people here in the audience, and uh, there's you know maybe ten minutes or so. So uh, I would say let's start with questions from the audience. Anyone? And if there's no one, well, I'll start with that. I was wondering, uh, Axel, I mean, can you can you um, use this formalism to give a bit more theoretical background on Gaia and the Gaia hypothesis from uh, from Lovelock? Yeah, I can. You know, I mean, this is uh, almost like another, um, uh, almost like another talk. You know, one can give. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, when you think about this kind of sequence, I mean, in the end, you know, I mean, I just said your feedbacks, I didn't talk about what kind of feedbacks these would be, right? And in the end, you know, what does, um, what did life do over Earth history, right? I mean, it, it actually created a huge chemical disequilibrium, right? I mean, so photosynthesis created um, carbohydrates, some of them were deposited and turned into hydrocarbons, and you created this disequilibrium of Chemically, what's chemically called reduced carbon and oxygen over the course of Earth's history, right? And, um, and by that, you also changed greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so there are certainly some feedbacks in the sense that um, when you start changing the atmospheric composition, especially with regard to greenhouse gases, then you start to change the radiative forcing of the heat engines. Yeah. yeah, and uh, when you change the radiative forcing of the heat engines, you can actually, you know, 
play with them and you can say, well, how much should be going into, a, um, you know, hydrologic cycling and how much should be going into um, creating motion directly and um, surface exchange. And so I think in principle, you can think about that these biogeochemical changes of the atmospheric composition may actually maximize the ability of the photos uh, of the biosphere to actually be productive. And then you would have sort of a thermodynamic version of a regulating system that would aim to maximize power. And by maximizing power is actually associated with negative feedbacks, because if you want to disturb the system, then it always wants to go back to maximizing power. It may not be necessarily a homeostatic system in terms of maintaining a steady temperature, but it's probably a quasi homostatic system in terms of maximizing power. And that I think actually sounds quite Gaian, if you um, can see what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any questions from online? Yeah, this is Yacht. Okay, yeah. Yacht, go ahead. I can't hear anything. No, no. Oh, it's still. Yeah, are you online? Still, you have mold? Um, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it's my misconception. I always thought that the higher the temperature, the more so the molecules move, and the higher the chaos, and the higher the entropy. But now you made the statements that the low temperature con uh, corresponds with high entropy and the high temperature with low. What, what is my misconception then? Yeah, you know, that's the tricky part. Okay. So, you know, what you have in mind, I mean, I can absolutely see where you're coming from. You know, usually when you talk, think about higher temperatures, you have a system that also has a higher heat content, right? Yes. And um, and so having a higher heat content means that you just because you have more heat, you have a higher entropy. When you take a fixed heat amount um, and add this fixed amount of heat at a high temperature, then you know you have the you know Clausius expression delta Q over T. So at a high temperature, this is an input of low entropy. Um, and when you take heat out at a low temperature, then you take the delta Q divided by a low temperature, and so you take high entropy out. Does that make sense? I'll have to think a little bit more about it, but uh, I'll, I'll take it that that's what it is, actually. So I'll think about it a bit more. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, I think this is actually a, quite a confusion. Um, I mean, yes. I... Had that confusion myself so you know i mean um you know it's the same thing with sunlight right i mean sunlight with a really high temperature but the point is when you fix it down to that the earth absorbs 240 watts per square meter so you don't vary how much the sun you get right i mean you say you absorb 240 watts per square meter and you emit 240 watts per square meter then you have a fixed amount of energy but you that but these amounts of energy they differ by the temperature so which i didn't put down here but i mean that's sort of basically um you know what i showed you earlier on right i mean um so you know again you know you have a fixed flux um you have a fixed flux of energy divided by a high temperature so you get a low number um of so for sunlight and if you take this fixed flux divided by cold temperature then you get a large number and this is what you get for thermal radiation. Thank you. May I ask you one thing? Could you put that down on, on paper and then can it be distributed by email so that I can read it again in more detail and maybe then think about it a bit more? Um, yeah, I mean, cool. I mean, I, I left the equations out because, you know, you know, this thing about, um, you know, the more equations you use, the more you lose the audience. So um, <laughs> nowadays I'm mostly on, on words. So, um, um, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Any more questions here? Anyone? Ah. Online? Anybody? Maybe I had also another question. I mean, 
of course, the, the, the main thing is what, what you can sort of determine with this principle, right, with the maximum work, which is very difficult to do otherwise in terms of you know, GCM simulations or observation limitations like in outer planets or, I mean, could you give an idea what you can do with that, which is not so obvious to do, you know, with available observations and models? You mean in terms of models? Well, in terms yeah. of, uh, you know, maybe a temperature gradient <laughs> on, uh, you know, uh, outer planets or even, uh, I mean, both situations where, you, where you're very limited in terms of modeling and observations, right? Well, I mean, I think one can, in principle, determine climate, right? I mean, in a relatively simple way. Um, although one needs certain assumptions, right? For example, that we have a relatively um, radiatively thick atmosphere, right? I mean, so that we have, um, you know, that if you, if you don't have an atmosphere, like if you go to the moon, um, then, um, you know, you don't have the ability to create this disequilibrium between the surface and the atmosphere, right? Because you only have a surface. And um, so the moon is a much, much simpler system because it simply absorbs solar radiation and emits it and nothing else happens, right? And um, so from that perspective, um, you can think of it as a system that doesn't perform work and it's much simpler. And in fact, with a colleague who is in a, Astrophysicist, we a few some some years back, we actually even made a planetary classification scheme out of this. You know, it's, so it's really about you know whether you can have climate, you know, whether you can have um, atmospheric heat engines on the planet. But for that, you need to have a radiative forcing, and you need to have an atmosphere to work with, right? Um, and then you can think about a biosphere. And there, I think the important constraint there is that, you know, you need to have a medium that transports stuff. And so it links it to the atmospheric heat engine, right? I mean, if you want to sort of deal with biology on a, I don't know, some distant planet or planetary body that is far away, that doesn't receive much sunlight. If you don't have much motion, you can't transport much stuff. And if you can't transport much stuff, you can't be metabolically much active. And I think it's actually a nice uh, illustration when you think about biogeochemistry, that the geo part is really quite essential to drive biochemistry because you need to have a transport mechanism. Uh, and this transport mechanism is thermodynamically constrained and, um, and you need to have an atmosphere to work with to actually have the ability to transport things and to generate disequilibrium like with a water cycle. And so I think if you can, you know, see an exoplanet and you know the radiative flux and you know it has an atmosphere that is radiatively active, then perhaps I think one could actually already estimate quite a bit of the climate um, of it and see whether it is habitable, not in terms of liquid water, but rather in terms of whether the biosphere can actually exchange mass. Thank you. There's another question huh? online. Oh, yeah. Yes, it has. Uh, Andrew? Uh, yes. Hi, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just wondering, could you comment a little bit on the interaction between this these thermodynamic limits and the contingency of evolutionary processes? So the, the, the claim that you have at the bottom here is that natural processes appear to work as hard as they can. Um, in the case of photosynthesis, you emphasized the importance of the gas exchange kinetics, um, but that depends on the, the performance of the Rubisco enzyme, which is seems to be stuck in this um, evolutionary local minimum because it evolved on a planet with much higher CO2 concentrations. So if that enzyme were different, then the interaction with the gas kinetics would be, would be quite different. Um, so I, I don't know, I mean, it's, I guess it's not a very clear question, but do you think that this claim would, would remain irrespective of, of how those uh, genetic, um, genetically determined processes had, had evolved? Well, you know, I mean, I think it, I mean, I, I can't give you the ultimate definite answer. I mean, I think it's, it's more about, you know, that, that there's a potential to um, think more about it. But if photosynthesis would be 
efficient, like 17%, like the theoretical estimate for converting sunlight into work, you know, the atmosphere would be empty. There would be no CO2 left, right? And I think this is sort of um, a mass constraint on photosynthetic activity that at least to me would suggest that the inefficiency of Rubisco is probably not so important because there is something else being more important. And that is that you have CO2 in the atmosphere. Do, do, do you see what I mean? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I follow the last bit. Well, you know, I mean, when you look at, you know, some studies um, of leaf gas exchange in the laboratory, I mean, they usually take the all the environmental environmental conditions as being fixed. Mm. Um, but if you want to scale up and scale it up to a whole planet, then you need to take other limitations into account. And that one of them is, you know, how do you get the CO2 out of the atmosphere? And this is something, I mean, the concentrations, I mean, okay, we are concerned about global warming, which is a completely different story. But for plants, the, the CO2 concentration is already quite low, right? Mm. So if the Rubisco was more efficient, I mean, how would you get more CO2 in? Did, did you see what the problem yeah, is? Yeah, I see. So I, I suppose it's a co-evolutionary process where the, the biology is constrained by the chemical composition of the atmosphere, but the, the opposite also applies, I guess. Well, I mean, the thing is, you know, when you think about it, I mean, um, what happened during planetary evolution is that you had emergence of um, herbivores some 30 million years ago, and um, also of grasses, and they turn over biomass more quickly. So you have, you know, you, they probably have a higher growth rate, and then the herbivores actually decompose quicker, the biomass, so you have a quicker turnover. And that's fine, because the herbivores basically release the CO2 back into the atmosphere, right? Hmm. And, and so, I mean, I could imagine, and then, but then you also need to have nutrients, of course. I mean, I didn't talk about nutrients at all. Um, but of course, you have that limitation as well factoring in here. And so, um, I think when you think about sort of this evolutionary perspective, I think it comes down to that you need to take the planetary perspective into account as well because of these limitations that are. Um, um, that are imposed by the environment in terms of mass exchange, right? Right. Great. Thank you. I think um, also in view of time, you know, people leave here already, uh, we have to stop. So Axel, uh, thank you very much again for your nice presentation and on this fascinating subject. And uh, we probably, uh, you know, will have some more lectures on this topic from different sites uh, also related to sustainability. So thanks again, and uh, let's uh, thank that. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the also for the interaction and nice, um, yeah, nice interactions. So yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Yeah, thank you for coming and also people online, and especially thanks for.